Uh, my name is Kiralee Rule, and I am the Honorary National Secretary of the Australian Institute of Physics. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today at our, our next AIP monthly webinar series, focusing on the ARC Centres of Excellence. So welcome and, and thank you. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. Many of you are joining us from locations across the country and, and even in New Zealand today. Um, but for, for me today, I'm located in Lucas Heights, uh, which is about 30k south of Sydney. So I'd like to pay my respects to the Darawal people and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and the community. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. So today we'll be hearing from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Transformative Meta-Optical Systems, or TMOS. And today we're being joined by uh, Dragomir Neshev from the ANU in Canberra. So Dragomir is a professor working in photonics, thin films and optical engineering and is the director of TMOS. And today Dragomir will tell us a little bit more about nanomaterials which are being developed by the centre for new smart miniaturised optical technologies. And for those of you who uh, don't know Dragomir so well, um, from what I read on the internet, Dragomir is also a bit of a Pokemon fan and has a beautiful dog named Evolution or Evie for short. So uh, thanks Dragomir, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kirli. So welcome everyone, welcome to this talk. So what I want to tell you today is uh, to introduce you to our centre of Excellence, which uh, has uh, officially started at the beginning of this year. Tell you who we are and what we do and how what our program is. And the, the title of the talk is A New Lens and How uh, Using Nanomaterials We Can Transform Optical Systems. And for those who don't know me, I'm a professor in physics at Australian National University and the director of uh, TMOS. So just with a little bit of introduction to those who are not familiar with the Center of Excellence, though maybe probably all of you are familiar with that, uh, Center of Excellence are the elite high quality research programs of the Australian government to support outstanding research and develop Australia's international standing in research areas of national priorities. And what I will try to, to convey to you is why is this uh, center, why is TMOS really part of these national priorities? But before we start, so in 2019, the Australian Research Council awarded two centers, two centers of excellence in the physics disciplines. And by conservation of uh, brightness, the two centers were dark matter and uh, light matters. So TMOS being uh, focused on uh, the application of, of light and in particular for designing of smart and miniaturized optical technologies making an impact on the, uh, to the society on the magnitude, what we've seen from the transistor and the Wi-Fi as uh, Wi-Fi being a particular uh, invention from Australia. Uh, the Australian Research Council has awarded us $35 million. It started beginning of this year. We have five universities, ANU, University of Melbourne, UTS, University of Western Australia and RMIT. So before I dig into the, the research and what, why meta-optical systems are important and why they're important for Australia, I want to introduce you first to the team, the TMOS at TMOS. So we are 15 chief investigators at the uh, five universities, as I mentioned before, uh, with myself as a director and Professor Ken Crozier from the University of Melbourne as a deputy director of the centre. We have uh, split of multiple disciplines uh, covering from material science uh, to optics and um, electronics. But uh, very importantly, now that the, the center is started, we are supported by an excellent professional team with uh, Dr. Mary Gray as the chief of operations of the center, uh, Galina Shadrigo as business coordinator, Peter Novotny uh, as uh, inclusion, diversity, uh, equity, and access coordinator. And to my knowledge, this is for the first time a center of excellence has a coordinator in this, in this, fee, in this uh, area to really put focus on how we, how we deal with this uh, big issue of diversity in the STEM disciplines. And of course, last but not least, uh, Samara Thorne is uh, our engagement manager who is coordinating all the engagement with uh, uh, external st stakeholders 
like industry, government, uh, and schools. Uh, and she's the one, if you follow our uh, Twitter account, she is the one who is also posting a lot of the information there. We also built into the quite a large international network uh, from uh, three continents, mostly from the United States, starting from University of Central Florida, uh, Duke University, uh, CUNY, and in New York, uh, University of Arizona, Northwestern University, and two partner investigators in, at Caltech, also in Singapore and in Europe, if you can call uh, British part of the community still, still part of Europe. Um, so back to the, our original question, why do we need optical systems? So I'll show you here an image of um, part of Canberra uh, with the balloon so, uh, in, uh, over the lake. So wh what we, while we're enjoying this, this image, what we can appreciate also is how many optical systems are being used to appreciate this image in order for us to observe and appreciate the world. And you might say probably one or two, but the, the answer is probably a lot more, starting from the photographer who has taken the photograph with a large camera, camera lens and a camera detector. And I don't know how many people have joined today, but tens of, I believe, tens of screens and cameras also looking, looking at this to, for us to all appreciate uh, such an image. So the, the bottom line out of this is that we use so many optical systems every day and we don't even realize and we don't really appreciate the complexity of these systems. Uh, but if we look back into the history, like the challenges, uh, what we have covered across the, from the middle ages, this is probably the first uh, optical instrument that has been recorded in the, the humankind. So 700 BCE, uh, the so-called Nimrod lens, now in the British Museum. It's been used by the ancient Assyrians to make uh, little models and to drawings and to magnify. It's about three times magnification uh, what this lens gives. So if you think so now, fast forward 3000 years to the current times, what we have is, uh, let's say a new phone, like uh, uh, this one here, uh, uh, iPhone, you get about a, a handful of lenses and the number of lenses that you can get in a phone is totally limited. And this is the lenses, the optical system is the one that is limited the thickness of this phone. So really for 3000 years from one to about a handful of, lens, of lenses. In contrast, if you think how many transistors this phone uh, packs in, it's a probably more than a billion transistor in just for 60 years of development of electronics. So this is a question, are we in optics lagging behind that for 300 years, we could only scale up an order of magnitude the number of optical systems uh, that we use. And this is potentially a problem. And if you look at some other uh, examples like this drone that we have here, a drone carries an environmental monitoring camera in the infrared. And this camera has the weight as far as the, uh, the weight of this camera is the same as the drone itself. So this drone does not fly very far. So this is clearly a bottleneck here that the optical systems uh, limit a lot of this uh, new application that we are seeing of miniaturized personal um, devices and, and uh, monitoring. And this is, uh, this is not just, uh, just for these two examples, but it actually comes across a wide range of, of um, development and coming starting from holographic displays that everybody wants to have in their uh, augmented reality set, uh, LiDAR technologies, wearable sensors, and ultra fast Wi Fi with the speed of light, a so called Li Fi. And these are new technologies that are being developing and forming a whole new uh, revolution, the so called fourth industrial revolution, which is transforming our society. Uh, and this revolution effectively merges the digital and biological world, worlds. And that is, that merges, so this interface between the two worlds is done with using light to interface the human and humans and machines. 
And this interface that we see here is uh, uh, very important for, for this development of uh, advanced manufacturing for autonomous vehicles and medical sensors. However, it's really not something that can be easily addressed with the current um, optical system with the current and bulky lenses that, that we use. So what is clearly on the agenda is that a new concept is required that optical system need to rely on in order to, to meet the demands of this new industry 4.0. And this is where um, our area comes in. So this is what meta optics is. Meta coming from the Greek word uh, meta meaning beyond, so beyond the existing optical systems. And in meta optics, for the first time, we have manipulation of light, not in the conventional sense of uh, refraction and reflection, but uh, by scattering from small nanostructures, nanoparticles that uh, range in arrays, as you see here in this image, arrays of nanoparticles that uh, capture the light, kind of concentrate it inside as a resonator. Now, if you think about it, like you can think of these uh, things for light, like a drum for, for sound. So this is one of my drum uh, drums here. So what is uh, what you heard of this drum is the resonances that this drum has, but also the different sounds that this uh, drum can can give. In a very similar fashion, these small nanostructure uh, resonators for the light and allow for the light to escape after uh, after they it's captured with uh, specified and tailored polarization, color, and phase. And what this, uh, this new concept allows us is to, to make lenses a lot thinner, so a thousand times thinner than a human hair, but at the same time to make a complexity of the optical system and the functionality a lot bigger. For the first time, one can just make a lens, not that can just image uh, cells, but uh, can also be a smart lens that can distinguish between healthy and disease cells. Uh, furthermore, the fact that these uh, nanostructures are fabricated on a planar film allows sort of to merge the, to merge the uh, chip making, like we know from the electronics industry, with the optics making. So the optics fabrication is becoming the same way as electronics making. And what this would allow is to make such big lenses that we usually know, and they're very complex to manufacture, big lenses for, for astronomy and for uh, space science uh, that have required complex polishing, three-dimensional polishing technologies to uh, prepare such lenses on a flat surface in the same way as making chips. And you can do this all across the entire spectrum of light starting from visible to the infrared. So this is a very powerful technique. And this is what this new concept gives us. If you look at the, the literature of uh, meta optics or meta surfaces as a more broader concept, uh, you will find uh, lots of different meta surfaces composed of different nanostructures of different shapes, as you can see here in these several images different shapes, materials, different materials coming from uh, plasmonic and metallic structures to the electric uh, high index structures to be able to, to make uh, very complex functions that are interleaved in a single surface uh, due to this discrete arrangement of, uh, of nanostructures. In addition, because of uh, this complexity, one now is able to perform very complex, uh, arbitrary complex operation, operations in the optics, uh, on the optics field, such as image processing and image classification and image recognition even. And furthermore, because these elements are nano, nanoscale elements, uh, they can be potentially reconfigured because of their nanoscale volume. And so these, these are very powerful concepts, but you might ask, what is actually the common, what is the common uh, physics and the common science that uh, goes behind all these different uh, types of, of elements. And the truth is that the, the science actually behind this re resonance scattering 
is described already more than 100 years ago, and it's been known to the to humankind with this um, uh, man here, Gustav Me, who already in 1908 described the scattering from small particles. The scattering was given by, by this formula, given two, two types of coefficients, which are uh, given here. Effectively, these are the el electric and magnetic modes of the scattering. So this was the, the new thing that uh, he discovered. So we have two types of modes that exist simultaneously in the scattering, two types of resonant modes, one which are due to the uh, oscillations of the electric fields. These are the electric family of the modes and another magnetic family, which are effectively oscillations of the magnetic field in these particles. And they, these modes have uh, different nodes and, and, uh, and complexity. Uh, like from the fundamental to the higher order mode. So while this could be a bit abstract, maybe we can illustrate uh, this again with my uh, favorite example of, uh, of a drum. And what you see- Here's the lowest frequency vibrational pattern in a circular membrane. This circular membrane is a piece of dentist rubber dam. It's stretched over a short length of PVC pipe and held in place with some rubber bands. So and you this lowest pattern, the entire membrane moves up and down together as one piece. The whole thing moves together. With the Here's the second mode. pattern for the same membrane. It occurs at a little bit higher frequency. Half of the membrane moves up while the other half is moving down. And there's a line right across the diameter called a node that doesn't vibrate at all. So then we will change the frequency to a higher value. So you can see this movie also on the YouTube. Here's the third pattern, so you get the, third the membrane. There are two mode, sections. Actually, it's here. kind of like a cloverleaf pattern. Two opposite sides of the membrane move up together, and the adjacent sections move down. So, so I'll stop uh, this uh, one so I don't uh, go too much over time. Uh, so I hope this example of the acoustic resonance clearly illustrates actually what's happening with light when they enter these uh, nanostructures. And what are they excite? Uh, what how these nanostructures are excited by different modes? What is important to, to mention that each of these modes, at least for spherical particle, uh, is resonant at, uh, at a particular wavelength. So the wavelength of the resonance for these mode is different. And what is important also to point out the difference between optics and uh, sound is this, uh, these two types of modes that we have in optics, electric and magnetic modes. So what uh, I have shown you here on the right uh, of this uh, slide is the resonances or the transmission uh, of light through modes, uh, through uh, array of such resonators. However, this time for simplicity, I have not used, I have not used spheres, but I have used cylinders. And what you can see here is the uh, what happens in the transmission. So at each of the resonant frequency, uh, the light is being captured inside these resonators and is being scattered backwards. So that's why in the transmission of the light, we're seeing these dips. So minimum in transmission. And if you look in the reflection, you will see a maximum in the reflection. Um, what is also important to, to point out that at each of the resonance is a resonant phenomenon, at each of the resonance, we have a pi phase shift of the transmitted light, change of the, the phase of the light with pi. And this is what allows this phase manipulation. However, at the early stages of the field, that was, uh, that was uh, hindered by the fact that with the right phase accumulation that you get, you also get this huge modulation of the, of the transmission, the, the transmission amplitude and transmission intensity. So the, the big change in, in the field came uh, also uh, as part of our research uh, when we realized that by changing actually the geometrical parameters of these disks, not just to mimic a sphere, but uh, changing the size of the disk, keeping the height the same, we can uh, bring together the two modes to be oscillate, uh, oscillating at the same frequency. So one is electric, one is magnetic mode. And so in this way, we can bring also this phase modulation, which comes closer and closer together. So if I continue to change the size, we can perfectly overlap the two modes. 
At that time, so this was uh, in this uh, paper here published uh, in 2015 from the, our group at the ANU. What we well, we were quite surprised to see that at the position where we actually overlap the two modes, the electric and magnetic modes, by changing the diameter of this disk, we actually saw a reduced transmission. So we were quite puzzled because we thought this reduced transmission is uh, uh, due to the reduced scattering. However, if you look at the, at the phase profile, it was clear that the, the phase is now changing, not just by pi, but by two pi uh, phase shift, which was an indication of a very strong resonant phenomenon. And if we change the, the disk, the particular, exactly particular size for, the, for its uh, uh, height, then what we could see is that the, the entire transmission of the light became flat. So we had no, no resonant phenomena inscribed in the transmission and no, of the, the scattering was entirely into the phase accumulation of the light that is transmitted through an array of such disks. And this particular condition is, uh, is called the Huygens condition. Uh, and it is called Huygens condition because it mimics uh, how Huygens principle works and the Huygens sources that only scatter in forward direction. And this is exactly a case where we have this only forward scattering or particular diameter of the disks. So now what one can do is using such a, this particular uh, condition that we have entirely unitary transmission through, through an array of such uh, disks, what one can do is to line up disks of, of different sizes in order to modify the phase of the transmitted light. So the different sizes effectively shift slightly the uh, the, the resonant frequency. And then the light that comes from this part of the, of the matter surface, so keep in mind this is all nanoscale dimensions, is only the light gets only uh, modulated by the phase shown here. The second one has a phase accumulation shown in this curve and so on and so on. So effectively this structure poses a phase gradient, linear phase gradient on the, on the transmitted light. And this happened with unitary efficiency for the transmission. So this was a groundbreaking result because allowed uh, the community to make, to make optical elements that have very high efficiency in transmission with full phase coverage from zero to two pi. So you name what phase you want, you can dial it in on your, on your meta surface. So effectively any phase profile can be encoded on a single step. Just as an, uh, as an example, uh, as I showed, showed you before, a typical example of a meta lens, a, a, a simple meta surface that focuses light in a, in a single point and can be used for imaging as well. So the way that works is for a lens, one needs to have a parabolic phase uh, inscribed on the beam that is transmitted through the, through the uh, meta lens. So this parabolic phase, now we can discretize in particular uh, in particular grid, it could be squared, could be hexagonal, doesn't really matter. And then for each of these phase on the discretization, one can assign a, a cylinder with exactly particular size, such that uh, such uh, elements of multiple disks of different sizes will inscribe a parabolic phase onto the transmitted beam. If you want the lens to be bigger, you just need to fold in two pi this transmission of the uh, for the light and encode more and more in this zero to two pi transmission. So this is what allows you to, to make a lens. If you want to make a, a beam steering device, you can just plot a linear gradient and so on and so on. So this was the basic of the of the meta optics and the, the field really exploded uh, after, after the ability to create highly efficient devices uh, made of nanostructures. But let's just uh, go back a little bit into the history and see how this, how this field had developed in Australia. So the field in meta optics in Australia, when, does, when did it first start? So everything has a long history from the meteor. But if you look in Australia, and dig a little bit in the literature, you will find this work published in Nature in 
1977, just a few months before the release of the first Star Wars movie. So can you guess what the, who were the authors of these papers? I hope some of them are here. So these were two blokes from the University of Sydney, David McKinsey and Ross McFedderan, who first uh, described uh, how to model a cubic lattice of particles and the permittivity, permittivity and conductivity of such lattices of small particles. Later on, both of these guys, uh, together with collaborators, so with uh, Professor Rox McFedderan, further described the problem of uh, cylinders that I also showed you before. So this was uh, 1979, uh, and not uh, far later, a very bright scientist, uh, Professor Ann Roberts, now professor in Melbourne, working at the time with, uh, with Ross McFeather and also described uh, how to make uh, special devices like bandpass filters made out of uh, small nanoparticles, in this particular case, uh, uh, annular apertures uh, in a gold film. So a long history in, in Australia and in 2011, uh, again, Ross McFeather and together with colleagues at the University of Sydney and at the ANU, we were the first actually to coin the term meta-optics for the whole world in, done in this, in this paper here. So that's why a lot of people have asked me, what is meta-optics? Why do you have such a technical title in, in your center? And the reason is that with keeping the meta-optics in the, in the title of our center, we keep the legacy that this field has in Australia. And since 2011, the, the field has been uh, really active and, and very, very diverse with a number of works done by the TIMOS uh, team, but also by other researchers, uh, including nanolasers, holograms, uh, tunable uh, beam steering, uh, single photon sources, made out of um, such elements, uh, tomography for quantum states and very high efficiency detectors. And that's what the foundation that our center builds on. Uh, and at the time, uh, while this was a very vi vivid film when we put in our application for the center, uh, most of the work that has been done is really on static uh, type meta-optics. So once you fabricate it, you fix it, and that's how you use it. Uh, however, in the center, we want to build a lot further beyond this static picture and to come to uh, an active meta-optics, being able to actively generate, dynamically manipulate, and detect light in these ultra thin materials by coupling of such nanostructures with uh, semiconductors and with other materials. And you can think this might be an easy task. However, if you think about the, the, the fact that the light is uh, a particle that doesn't really easily interact with matter, it's actually very difficult to do such things in ultra thin, uh, ultra thin materials, such as few, few hundred nanometers thin materials. So this is where the challenge is, and this is where this resonant phenomena of the light build the foundations for, for these light matter interactions at the nanoscale for light generation, dynamic manipulation and detection. So in our center, these three parts build the pillars of the research program. Uh, and in the next uh, few slides, I hope to, to show you a little bit uh, of the flavor, what we do currently in this research program. So we have three pillars with several programs under each pillars and several capabilities enabling this, uh, this uh, research in the three pillars. However, the real impact of the center is by combination of the three pillars to really target applications in holographic displays, night vision technologies, wearable optical sensors, light, LIDAR type technologies, remote sensing, and ultra fast light based Wi Fi technologies. So, Starting with the first with the first team that we have research team on light generation, which is aimed to control wavefronts, but by ultra thin materials, uh, control the coherence and quantum properties of the generation of, of the light that is emitted from ultra thin materials. And as a particular focus is to be able to generate color holograms with uh, and light states with tailored quantum properties. 
So I want to run you through a few examples. In these examples, I won't go into details deeper into the physics, uh, but I hope you can contact me uh, later on or the, the researchers behind each of these, uh, of these uh, uh, research areas. So when we talk about nanolasers, nanolasers and nanolasers array is what you need in order to make your phone to gener generate your holograms. If you are a um, Star Trek or a Star Wars fan, um, yeah, you need a device that can emit with a controlled wavefront uh, in order to generate a hologram. And you cannot do this with the LED, so with our displays that we currently have in the, in the phones, you need a coherent light. If you want to build this in this display in an augmented reality um, set or in a mobile phone, you need this to be highly miniaturized submicron level. And this is the research uh, done by um, the guys, uh, led by the guys at the ANU, uh, Jagadish and Hotan. They uh, developed in 2013 the nanowire lasers. Uh, which, however, were broken down to put on a substrate and they were emitting in the plane of the substrate. Uh, so if you want to do a, a, a display, however, all these uh, lasers need to emit vertically, you need to emit into, to reconstruct the wave from. So this is what the, the research at Timos is going on. So last year, um, the team at the ANU worked on uh, putting such lasers, such uh, nanowire lasers, into a bull-eye apertures in order to make a highly directional emission, as you see here, and also currently developing new types of lasers, like these micro ring lasers that can emit broad uh, or multi-mode type emission. However, this work has lots of uh, new challenges to explore. In particular, once you put these arrays, these lasers into arrays, how to control their coupling, how to control their wavefront, how to make this electrically driven um, and how really do, to build this in a device. So this is, these are areas which are open and that uh, our center will work towards this direction. Once you have lasers that generate a particular wavelength of light, if you want to change this light, you need to do something different. So what um, we've been doing at the ANU is using the so-called nonlinear processes, which uh, do interactions between several laser beam in nonlinear materials to convert the light from one frequency to another frequency. And as a particular application for this process shown here, which is called some frequency generation where two photons combine to generate a new photon at a higher wavelength. We have shown how to use this process, how to enhance this process in metasurfaces using this resonant enhancement of the light fields inside the, inside the nanostructures and use this for up conversion of infrared images using a pump beam to convert these images coherently to the, infra, uh, to the visible domain such that can be observed either by eye or by standard CMOS cameras, such that these type of night vision devices are not affected by the thermal noise or by other uh, difficulties with infrared detection. So to do this, uh, uh, a bright colleague of mine who is now uh, in UK, uh, Moxan Rahmani developed this uh, kind of technique to actually collect a very high nonlinear nanocrystals from aluminum gallium arsenide fabricated here by the group of Professor Jagadish and Hotan to peel them off into a polymer layer and to be able to put them on a transparent substrate such that they can really be used as a metal uh, surfaces to enhance the light matter interaction. And um, as a recent example, uh, which uh, is on this archive publication here, we were able to show that uh, an infrared image, so this is taken by a conventional infrared camera, can be converted to visible direct to the green light. So and observed on a very cheap uh, CMOS uh, camera, $200 camera from, uh, bought from Tolabs. So we proved this convention, uh, this concept of uh, image conversion with uh, um, the images are correctly, the images of these star, uh, Siemens stars are correctly displayed. Well, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to be able to enhance this conversion efficiency so that uh, these devices are really, uh, to be able to really uh, enhance the performance of these devices to be comparable with the 
with the infrared imaging sensors. And of course, bring this to the eye level kind of uh, eye form uh, or spectacles form type type devices with large field of view and good directionality of the emission. And my colleague Ken Crozier at uh, University of Melbourne has already proposed and will be working on such schemes uh, using upconverting nanoparticles coupled to such meta surfaces. Uh, the team also, also, our center also has a large focus on quantum and enabling quantum technologies, quantum materials and single photon sources. In particular, the group of um, uh, at UTS, uh, Milos Todt and Igor Haronovic, uh, have been working for many years now on single photon sources in two-dimensional materials such as uh, hexagonal boron nitride. And you see here all these uh, colored dots, uh, single photon sources that are really single and really quantum emission because this second order correlation drops below 0.5, so really giving a quantum light. However, a lot of these emitters, as you can see, are difficult to distinguish. And within the TMOS framework, they're exploring the coupling of such emitters to, to nano antennas to be able to access their internal degree of freedom, like a spin or uh, valley polarization of such, such emitters in order to, to enhance and to really design their properties. The group is also uh, exploring other materials like uh, an enhancement of other materials through nano cavities and micro cavities such as diamond photonics. Uh, but of course, there are lots of open questions still that we need to, to resolve uh, under the, the TMOS framework, uh, including what is the nature of these defects, how one can um, control these defects and, and deterministically uh, induce such defects, having ind indistinguishabilities of such emitters, and being able to properly tune such uh, such materials. The work led by uh, my colleague here, Andrei Sukurukov, extends this further to not just to single photons, but to multi-photon uh, generations uh, through uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion for entangled photon generation and really measurements of these multi-photon states using metamaterials and meta-optics to be able to do a single shot quantum state tomography. Of course, a lot of open question in front, questions in front of us for the next years to, to work uh, on generation of the entangled uh, photons of different spatial modalities, which is something unique to, to these metasurfaces and transformation of such multi-photon states uh, from one quantum state to another. And of course, looking at applications in uh, quantum imaging, communications and spectroscopy. Within the second team for, uh, for light manipulation, the center aims to develop um, meta, meta optics for dynamic light manipulation in space and time. Uh, and this will be for uh, high modulation uh, with wide angle and high speed for Li-Fi and light, light, LiDAR type technologies. And within this uh, second team, we have uh, several works that are strongly going ahead in particular using meta surfaces for image processing. This is a direction led by Professor Anne Roberts at the University of Melbourne, who have shown that uh, just a simple layer of meta surfaces can do a special uh, filtering in the case space without needing of a complex uh, uh, imaging systems, uh, 2F, 2F imaging systems with lenses, so that can be on, all done in a single layer to, to produce so-called edge detection of the images. And these are very important filters for, for, autonomous, uh, for autonomous vehicles, where all these uh, edge filters are, are really what is used in, in current, currently with electronics to, to make these uh, uh, self-autonomous uh, vehicles. In our group, we have also explored this, uh, these directions by looking at the resonance enhancement of such filtering through uh, mi resonances. Uh, in particular here, as you see the edge detection of the Australian parliament uh, published uh, recently in the ACS photonics. And Anne has gone uh, a step further together with Tim Davies uh, to really apply such a processing to uh, live cell imaging for phase contrast microscopy 
And here with the acknowledgements to, to Tim Davis, who is associate investigator on the center, just uh, a one quick video to, to show how such imaging of live cell, cells can be enhanced by using a nanophotonic devices or metasurfaces of this kind. So the, the metasurface is in the plane and on top of the metasurface, which is called here the device. So this is of the device. There are various cells that are being deposited. So you see here, there are lots of cells, but without the device, you cannot really see where the cells are. However, once the device is being moved in the field of view of the camera, you can see huge amount of cells that have been deposited. So really this phase contrast microscopy enhances the imaging. It's a really simple uh, opportunity to incorporate in any microscopes in the world. Of course, lots of open questions here as well. Implementing of complex optical filtering, switching and tunability of uh, filtering functions, uh, bioimaging and microscopy applications. The group at RMIT, um, uh, Shiraz Shiram and uh, Madhu Baskaran, they have also gone further than these, basically putting multi layer optics, multi layer meta optics, to generate a neuromorphic uh, meta optic system, which uh, with the fact that these stacks, effectively stacks of meta surfaces, what you see here, uh, can mimic the functions of the brain yeah, as, a, as a real neural network. So the designs are fabricated by another bright guy at RMIT, Ben Cumming, and show re used really for, for image, um, image processing and image uh, uh, classifications. And ben has gone a step further to apply such, such schemes for adaptive optics, being able to really stabilize uh, a star using such a neural network when you uh, look at the star uh, through the atmosphere, which is normally would require complex and dynamically tunable, tunable uh, optics, uh, adaptive optics to control. Again, uh, multiple uh, important questions that are in front of us to be able to dynamically reconfigure this uh, neural network, put uh, nonlinear activation layers really to mimic the, the work of the brain. And tunability is a big part of the of the, the system of the center because tunability is what is required if you want to reconfigure any optical system. As an example, uh, of a lens that is uh, has a uh, needs to focus on different objects has to be reconfigured to have var focal focal length in order to focus at different depths of the objects. And the group at RMIT have uh, mastered uh, stretchable and optoelectronics with electronics controls inside. And this is a, a, a technology that is uh, being translated in the medtech. But they're also developing materials, phase change materials that can be used for um, blocking infrared vision. So really uh, blocking the, the thermal radiation coming out of these uh, boiling water, as you can see here, like a VO2 materials uh, with boiling water uh, and without VO2 materials with boiling water you see this uh, right uh, signature of the hot water inside. Well, this is completely um, completely shielded if it's covered by the view. Going a little bit further because I don't want to run out of time. So to uh, tunable meta optics, uh, we explore multiple platforms, including liquid crystals, electro optics, and micro electromechanical systems at the University of Western Australia. And we work really to develop this in a, in a working type devices. The last theme, the detection part of the center is the detection of Im images or e an imaging of the invisible properties of light, such as infrared uh, light, phase and polarization and so on. And this is very important for application when you want to look into the, uh, the smoke. So this is uh, infrared vision uh, in a fire. So, a firefighter can see a, a person lying on the ground here using infrared vision. So meta optics, uh, infrared vision could really be helping to save human lives here. Uh, and as a start, uh, there are several developments. So Professor Ken Crozier is developing these uh, miniaturized spectroscope, uh, miniaturized spectrometers that are based on structural colors in, in silicon. And because of the resonances, each of these parts are resonant at particular wavelengths. So you see 
a clear image here of the different wavelengths and the colors of different wavelengths that are present and be able to detect uh, immediately with a very high accuracy uh, the spectra of the incoming light. And that uh, will be de uh, developed further to apply for hyperspectral imaging uh, and realize a miniaturized FTAR uh, spectrometers and really find the optimal detection responsibility to be able to identify uh, chemicals or other uh, target molecules that are in close proximity with, with the spectrometer. And the group uh, uh, at the ANU have uh, further developed uh, nanowire type detectors in order to detect light with uh, di uh, different polarizations. You can see here the nano hashtag uh, detector published uh, light, uh, last year in Science. And the group of Francesca Jacopi at UTS uh, have been also exploring a new platform of graphene of silicon carbide in order to make new types of detectors uh, when the, the graphene is really uh, en enclosing the silicon carbide on the top. And again, lots of open questions to, to develop a high performance uh, angular selectivity, polarization, and quantum level detection. And last but not least, the group uh, at uh, UWA have uh, this uh, very exciting technology, mercury cadmium telluride detection, which is unique in Australia. And just a few of these in the world. So we can, they are clearly the leader in this creating infrared detectors and mid infrared detectors. You can see here working prototype and one image of this uh, working prototype really in the infrared and notice here this visibility what's in the pocket. With this person here, you can see through the clothes uh, really for important applications in, in monitoring uh, and combined with the uh, security and combined with uh, MEMS type technology can be used for hyperspectral imaging, monitoring of fruit and agriculture. But of course, the whole, uh, the whole impact of the center comes together when all these three, three topics are uh, really combined. And this goes into multiple technologies for transport, health, defense, education, communication and agriculture. Uh, and uh, last year, the Australian New Zealand Optical Society released a report for the uh, photonics industry in Australia. So if you haven't read this report, go to the Australian New Zealand Optical Society website, optics.org.au, and you will see that this is a vivid industry and it's really building a lot and is growing on this, on this uh, new type of technologies and is forming at the moment $5.4 billion dollars in the Australian New Zealand economy, employing more than 12,000 people and over 500 companies. And we expect this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna grow in the next years due to this development of uh, Industry 4.0. And special thanks to the authors of this report, John Harvey, Simon Poole, John Lincoln, who really made a, a incredible work here and are hoping to, to show the, the growth of the industry in photonics in Australia in the next years. As an example of the industries in Australia, uh, one of our partners is seeing machines uh, and they're working in driver fatigue monitoring, which is a big uh, important case uh, for, uh, for stopping uh, road accidents or fatal ro uh, road accidents. It's a huge market, but of course comes with huge problems because uh, uh, every car is jam packed with, with equipment and there is no space. To, to put enhanced driver monitoring inside the car. So this is where these miniaturized optical technologies come into place to be able really to illuminate the driver to do face ID of the driver. So you won't require any start uh, uh, engine key, uh, but also be able to discriminate the reflections from, from eyewear such as glasses here, which will allow such technologies to be really, really um, accurate in detecting the, the awareness of the driver on the road, such as to be able to switch between, between self-driving modes and, and uh, uh, manual operation of the mode. And uh, the, there is a huge industry pool to the whole field. I'll just very quickly describe what's happening uh, uh, across the world. So this is, a, uh, this is a graph of different applications uh, like vision here. There is a TRL level on the bottom. So uh, 
the ones on the left are high TRL levels and the, the ones on the right are lower technology transfer level. So we're already seeing several companies in the field. So MetaLens is uh, making lenses for mobile phones. Uh, Lumotif is uh, working on, on uh, LiDAR type technologies. Uh, iPhones already have a part of such technologies for Face ID and we're using it. So this is how the, how the meta surfaces look like. Uh, it's already in the phone, uh, but we also see huge growth in AR and VR type sets, uh, polarization imaging for defense and so on, and image classification for, for real identification. Samsung is pushing really hard holographic displays. Uh, a company called Meta Optics uh, is uh, doing uh, notch filters for protections of pilots, especially for, from laser illumination. Uh, and somewhat on the lower TRL level, we have the microscopy parts, uh, as we saw from, from Anne Roberts, but also from other groups, and the biosensing based, the optical sensing based on meta surfaces, as coming from some of the initiatives also in, in the ANU. The center has multiple partners. I'm nearly finished. Uh, multiple partners that are committed, but of course, uh, we have uh, partners that are really happy, uh, looking forward to engage in the future, looking for opportunities uh, and joint, joint uh, ventures, uh, so to say. And beyond that, beyond the industry, what the center aims is to really drive a multidisciplinary uh, and inclusive culture for leaders by uh, promoting several programs in education. So we've already run several um, colloquia, two colloquia. So today we had a very exciting colloquia by Professor Kishan Dulakia on, on bioimaging. And we want to support such activities in Australia for everyone, really also to help in the education in STEM, kind of bringing some of the, some of the work forward, helping with the uh, school cur curriculum and public engagement with everyone. And last but not least, we are really committed to equality, uh, any types. So we have focus on, on, uh, uh, on uh, gender equality, and we have done already a women-only recruitment. We had 200 women applying for such of the Timos position under pandemic uh, situation, so it was uh, exceptional. We have hired uh, already the first round of, uh, of researchers for the center. And we will continue to, to help these by training programs uh, to reduce biases and improve training. And so last slide to everyone, I welcome you to, to work together. Uh, there is plenty of room at the bottom as Richard Feynman has said, there's a, a lot of work to be done as some of the open questions I, I showed you. And I hope we can work together in the discovery of new science, but also in transforming this science to the new industry to make impact on the society. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Dragomir. This was a terrific talk. Um, your center is doing a lot of uh, excellent work with a lot more to come, I can see. So we have a question and answer uh, down the bottom. Uh, there's a little button down the bottom of your screen if you wanted to put some questions in and I will read some out for Dragomir. So we have a couple of questions already. Uh, John Canning has asked a couple of questions. Um, the first one was with respect to your uh, drum uh, video that you were showing, your YouTube drum video. Um, he, he asked the question, um, but drums are macro modes from the cavity, not acoustic scattering. Is this right? So drums are macro modes uh, from the cavity, yeah, that, that, that is right. Uh, you can also do scattering uh, and uh, that, that also works in a, in a similar fashion, uh, but they are, as I said, they're different in, uh, with respect to the optics, to, to many aspects. So it's good to, to draw this analogy because it's really visual to see how the membrane operates, uh, but I wouldn't stretch it too far indeed. Excellent. So we, we have another question here from Andrew Wee. Uh, what is the role of your international collaborators? Uh, so excellent question. So Andrew is uh, a partner investigator on the uh, on the center, and thank you, Andrew. So we have, uh, have seen a uh, very difficult uh, time last year because international collaboration, to a large extent, 
relies on on exchange of people to be able to network to to generate the new ideas and to to place students in in the new environments so that they can learn and to give and that's been all taken out suddenly uh, so the at the current at the current stage until this this uh, previous times uh, return that we can really exchange exchange students and exchange uh, uh, visits between the collaborators what we what we will aim to do is uh, build all of, uh, of our partner investigators into into our colloquium program so wait for invitation in the next uh, month uh, to, to speak and that will be open for the entire Australian community uh, and we will be uh, uh, we'll be in these uh, hot topics of, of, uh, of research. And I hope by the end of next, uh, this year, we will be able also to, to, to be more interactive on, on personal level. Fingers crossed. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and Andrew, thanks you for that, that answer. So we have another question from um, Suvanka Sen, who says, wonderful presentation, Dragomir, thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, can meta lenses be used in concentrated photovoltaics for renewable energy applications? Thank you, uh, Suvanka. So it's a very important question and maybe half of the community will answer yes. I will be a bit more cautious and I will uh, say that one of the uh, difficulties in, not difficulties, but one of the drawbacks in the uh, meta optics uh, system is the fact that they're highly dispersive. So once you start dealing with uh, very broad spectral bandwidth, uh, that is uh, uh, not an ideal application for meta optics. So indeed, I, I showed you Meta Lens is one of the companies that is trying to put this for uh, for mobile phones. So this is indeed uh, uh, the, what they're showing at the moment operation of, of the order of 200 nanometers bandwidth. But this is, so this is to some extent is okay for, for mobile phones and can be done with, can be improved with uh, multiple layers of lenses. Uh, however, for solar concentrators, I believe that will be a very hard, hard uh, deal and probably you will be better off still uh, using a mirror type uh, optics. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question of my own now, if you don't mind. Uh, these beautiful photos and pictures that you showed, I guess they were TEM images of the um, cylinders of different uh, uh, diameters. How are these materials actually made? Are you making them through etching processes or how, how are you controlling and making these materials? Thank you, Kirill. So this is very, very good uh, question. So at the moment, how things are made are done through mostly through electron beam lithography. Uh, and this is uh, kind of standard what people use in the lab. And uh, it is good, but it's not a high throughput uh, device, high throughput uh, techniques. So UV lithography is something that we, that we are looking. And I just wanted to show this uh, example here, uh, which is a, a little bit different. This is from Ben Cumming at RMIT who is using actually 3D laser writing at a very, very small scale. So very uh, super resolution laser writing effectively to do this. So, but again, this is uh, less of a scalable technique. So uh, once this technology needs to go commercial, it needs to be working with, with foundries, with the CMOS foundries and needs to comply with the, all the CMOS uh, regulations. However, it is possible and that's what we are looking really actively. Excellent, thank you. Okay, we, we've got time for one very last question again from Savanka. Um, can we design in theory a spectrum selective meta surface or meta surfaces for, manipul for manipulation or detection applications? The short answer is yes, and it's a very big field. Yeah, so the, this, is, this is one of the applications which meta surfaces are, are really important and really, I believe, this is my personal opinion, but I believe this is when meta materials and meta optics will make a huge impact because you can incorporate the lenses with the dispersion. So you can make hyperspectral imaging, for example, you can focus all your different components into different parts of your, of your uh, chip, of your detectors. You can do all sorts of...
uh, other interesting uh, ideas. So I believe that will be a huge application. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us. And, and thank you to Dragomir once more for um, a really thorough uh, talk about TMOS and the work that, that's going on there. Um, so thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you as well. Have a good uh, weekend, everyone. Excellent. Thank you.